our church, whether you're here seated with us or with a Facebook or YouTube, we thank you all for coming. Today uh, we are going to be reading from Acts. The title is called It's Worth it, the Risk. Acts 10, 27 through 33. Acts 27, 10, 27 through 33. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour and at three in the afternoon suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon Peter, uh, Simon, who is also called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon, the tanner who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word. I want to give you all a scenario, a what if. And I want you to think about this. Okay, let's, let's just say, we'll pick on the women at first. Let's say one of, that you ladies, uh, one of you went to work at a new job and there was a lot of people there and of course you men it could be the same way and you got to know everybody and there was a particular lady that you really connected with you all loved, loved to do the same things you had kids and uh, just like each other did both of you did and and you loved doing all these same things you went shopping together even went to each other's house a time or two but during the course of that first year you talked about church and the we had a church picnic and how much the fun the kids had and blah, blah, blah. And she knew that you were a Christian. But in the meantime, you found out with just small talk that she didn't go to church and she didn't know Jesus Christ. And then one day, Friday evening, before going home from work, she says to you, I'm going to have me, my husband, and my family, my grown kids and a couple of neighbors at my house tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And I want you to come and tell us how to accept Jesus Christ and get to go to heaven. What would you say? Would you be ready? Would you say, I'll be there at a quarter till? Or would you say, well, you know, I've got to wash the car tomorrow. <laughs> or would you say, well, I'll get you a book. Well, you know, those wouldn't be good answers. Or what if you say, well, what if I bring my minister with me? That seems like a good answer. And she says, well, you know, I know you real well, and I wasn't wanting to clean house that good. <laughs> I want you to come. Would you be ready? Could you do it? The Bible says we should be ready. So today... We're going to talk about the very thing that happened. That's exactly what happened in our story today. I didn't get to read the whole thing. But it happened. In Acts 10, it's recorded, Simon Peter got a message that a man by the name of Cornelius, who was a very important man, but he was a Gentile, wanted him to come and tell him about Jesus. Now, he could have had a bunch of excuses, too. First, he was a Gentile. They weren't even supposed to, in the laws of the land then, even go into a Gentile home, let alone go to preach to him. But he knew God had already given him a message that he was supposed to send the, the news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So he knew that wouldn't be a good excuse. He could have said, well, why not send the angels? Well, we learned last week the angels don't do that. They don't spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Why would Peter even care about Cornelius, a Gentile, if he believed or not? Because the Bible tells us that God won't, doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He wants everyone to be saved. The Bible says that the way, the gate is wide. And he learned and was learning that the gate was wide and everybody was invited. But the way is narrow. Let's look at the scripture, John 19, uh, 14, 6. 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now that is either true or it's false. It can't be a little of each. It's either true or false. Either Jesus is the only way to heaven. There's no other way. Either it's that or Jesus is a kook, a fake, and it's completely false. It's our job to take that message to other people that it's real, that it's true. It's our privilege and it's our obligation for others to know Jesus. But how do we do it? You know, some of us don't feel comfortable in talking and we have all these excuses. So I'm going to show you how to be a soul winner. The threefold system. How to be a soul winner, threefold system. Number one, it must be a personal confidence. A personal confidence. A, you must be a believer that believes with all your heart. You must be a believer that believes in all of your heart. Well, what do we believe? That's the first thing that we might have to think of is what do I believe? Well, it's, here it is. Acts 10, 39 through 42. And this is what Simon Peter told Cornelius. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But Jesus raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the king of the living and the dead. These people, the disciples, they were no longer afraid. Simon Peter and the disciples were no longer afraid. They were bold now. They were convinced they were no longer hiding in the caves and afraid to get killed. They were out preaching and teaching in the, in the synagogues and in the streets and anywhere anyone would listen. They were convinced. They were excited about the, the Jesus Christ. Could even go to the Gentiles now. They were absolutely, positively convinced. All believers are different. These disciples were all different. If we went through each and every one, we would see some of their weaknesses and some of their strengths. John and Peter and Thomas, they were all different. They all had different personalities. Some were very strong-headed. Some were very uh, calm. Some were doubters, like Thomas. But they all had something in common. But you and I are all different. We're called to, to lead other people to Jesus Christ, but we're all different. Some of us are called to be ministers. Some are not, but we're all called to be able to tell about Jesus Christ. And we're all a little bit different. Some of us think that, that we, we need to sing more songs. Some think we sing too many now. <laughs> Some think that the church service is too short. Some think it's already too long. Some think we ought to be saying amen and raising our hands, and some think we're already too loud. We're all different. But there are certain things that we are absolutely, positively sold on. We are absolutely, positively convinced of, and this is B. All believers are sold and unanimous on three things, okay? Here are the things that we can go into these houses with and talk into at work with. Number one, Jesus' 
virtuous life. Jesus' virtuous life. Look at Acts 10, 38, what Peter told these men. Now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and the power, and how he went around doing good and healing and all who went uh, under the power of the devil because God was with them. Peter had seen all this. The disciples had seen it. They were eyewitnesses. They had seen the works and the character of Jesus Christ. They had seen him take the children into his arms. They had seen him walk on water, cleanse lepers, walk, <coughs> making the lame walk. Two different occasions they witnessed God speaking to Jesus out of the clouds. Once with Jesus' baptism and once in his transformation. And they heard and heard him, God say, this is my son with whom I am well. Please listen to him. Two times they had heard that. Can you imagine that standing there and all of a sudden, this is my son. No, it's God. They heard that. They saw it. They were witnesses. They ate with him. They touched him. And they believed. They believed. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. So we, they knew Jesus' beautiful life. Number two. Absolutely sure of Jesus' death and burial. Peter said, I saw him die. I saw him dragging that cross. I saw him being whipped and beaten. I saw him up on that cross. And I saw him, his limp, dead body taken from that cross and buried in a tomb of a wealthy man. I saw that. And then I saw Jesus, we touched him, and we ate with him. Excuse me, I jumped ahead. They saw that, and they laid him in a borrowed tomb. Verse 39, he said, they killed him by hanging him on a tree. And then the third one, the third one, the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were absolutely sure of it. The victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at Acts 10, 40 and 41. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him, and, and he rose from the dead. They saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. They knew that they knew that they knew that he was alive. But when we talk to people about this, there's going to be scoffers, and so did they. They said, yeah, but, but Peter, you know, how can we be sure that you saw him after he was dead alive? You know, maybe it was a vision. I've heard these excuses myself many times. What if it was a vision? Well, well, you know, what if it was a dream? Maybe it was a ghost. Those men loved him so much, maybe they just thought they saw him. Acts 1.30. Acts 1.30. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. That's a long vision, isn't it? I've never had a dream that long. Have you? That's a long time. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 6. 15, 6. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of his brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. 500 people having the same dream, the same vision, for 40 days? Hmm. And then someone will say, well, what if Peter was lying? What if those disciples were lying? Well, Peter says, I am willing to die for what I believe in, and in fact he did. 
And most of those disciples did die for what they believed in. Do you know this? Let me ask you a question. Who is willing to die for a lie? Many may be willing to die for what they believe the truth is. But no one is willing to die for a lie. People lie to get out of trouble, not to get into trouble like the disciples did. We too have that same kind of confidence of a virtuous life. The death and burial and victorious resurrection. We can be the soul winners with that kind of confidence. Number two, the powerful con conviction or confirmation of Scripture. The powerful confirmation of Scripture. A, the Old Testament prophets were also unanimous about Jesus. They were all unanimous about Jesus. Let's look at Acts 10.43. Acts 10.43, all the prophets testified about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That was from the beginning until the New Testament start when Jesus was born. Over 300 prophecies before Jesus was even born, hundreds of years, some of them, thousands of years, was before Jesus was even born. They all directly were filled by Jesus Christ all by one man was filled 300 plus uh, prophecies. But you have doubters. And the doubters might say this. Well, it was probably all prearranged. It was probably rigged. Well, you know it was. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you know it was. But let's look at this real quick. Did Jesus arrange it? Let's look at this. Jesus... Number one, would be born in Bethlehem. That's in Micah 5.2. Micah 5.2. That Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Would Jesus be able to control that? Would he be able to say where he was going to be born? None of us were able to do that. And then number two, Jesus was born of a virgin. That was in Isaiah 7.14 says that he would be born of a virgin. You know, that would even be hard to make up. If you were trying to make up a story, would you say that? That Jesus would be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14, hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Three, Jesus' uh, crucifixion was described seven to eight hundred years before they even came up with crucifixion. The Bible in Psalms 22, 16 talks about him being pierced. His body being pierced. And then number four. Killed among thieves. Isaiah 53 talks about how there would be thieves around him when he died and he was between two. He was between two. It was arranged all by God. Years and years from the beginning of time, this was all arranged, just like we said. Personal conviction, personal confidence, confirmation of the scriptures, Old Testament and new. You and I can look back and see how all the Old Testament scriptures were proved from the, with the New Testament, plus all the others about what Jesus did and so on. Number three, the persuasive conviction of the Holy Spirit. The persuasive conviction of the Holy Spirit. A, we present, but the Spirit converts. The Spirit converts. You and I, you've heard me tell many times about how I'm so excited if someone came to, to church, but they didn't come back, and I blame myself, and I realize that I don't convert people. I just set the table. Whether they eat or not, that's up to them. And I've also told you this, 
Whatever I can preach for 15, 20, 30 minutes, someone can unpreach in five. So oh, that Bobby never did know what he's talking about. That'd be about all it takes. But the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Acts 10, 44, Acts 10, 44, this is exactly what happened to Cornelius' family. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came to all who heard the message. They all received it. They all accepted it. They all believed it. Look at Acts 5:32. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The Holy Spirit comes to us. We open our hearts and our minds, and it comes to us, and we believe it. And the Holy Spirit is there. Look at 1 John 5, 9 through 10. 1 John 5, 9 through 10. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is testimony of God, which we have given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe, God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God had given about his Son. We can trust and believe the testimony of the Holy Spirit. It's not in our head, but it's in our hearts. The Holy Spirit enables us to believe. The Holy Spirit at some point in time have come into us. We've accepted. We said, Lord Jesus, come unto me. The Holy Spirit enables us to tell others. And the Holy Spirit causes their hearts to change. We represent the word by deed or by our mouth. It's up to us. We're all able to do it. Personal confidence, powerful uh, confirmation of the scriptures, and amazing power of the Holy Spirit. We all have that ability. I'd like to close with a story that you all are very familiar with. The Titanic was supposed to be the most luxurious, unsinkable ship ever. But it landed in tragedy. And there's a lot of tragedy more than just the fact that it sunk and people died. First tragedy is that they got several messages to watch out. Watch out for the icebergs. But they all looked out the window and looked out the, on the sea. They didn't see anything. Kind of reminds us of uh, uh, Noah and the Ark, doesn't it? They didn't see rain coming. They didn't know what it was. So that 1,500 people died because they kept silent. Second tragedy was the lifeboats. The lifeboats were half full when they put them out into the water of that ICC. Only half full. Designed to save people, but only half full. And then the other tragedy is this. The people that were on those boats, that were safe, that were floating away, heard all of those people screaming and hollering for help. And they were afraid. They didn't want to go back because they were afraid that they would tip the boats over and maybe they would drown. So they just didn't listen. And they let all those 1,500 people die because it was too risky for them to go back. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ can be risky for us too. Offering the gift of salvation, some might make fun of you. Some may call you holier than thou. Some might tease you being reverend. They might avoid you. And I think one of the biggest things we're concerned about is at being asked questions we don't know. You know, that wouldn't be a bad thing. First off, we would probably go and find out the answer. We can always say, well, you know, I'm not sure. I'll go find out. 
then you can go back to the pastor and maybe then together you can go together. But that first step oftentimes is not by the pastor, but the people that love them. Yes, there's risk. But when someone is dying, offering them a gift of salvation is probably worth the risk. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, with your Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, for the words that you've given to us today. Now we sincerely ask you to give us the strength to be able to do it. If there's someone out there that's sinking today, as our old song says, and we could be used, send us. Send us to that person that's in need. Help us, O oh Lord, to do what we need to do to give them the hope and the peace and the joy that comes only from the understanding and love of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning. Anyone who'd like to join our church or dedicate their lives to Christ may come forward during this hymn.